You might have heard of fashion trends which will come and go, but did you know that in British gardening there has been many different trends over the years, which some have come back round again as well. So I thought today I would give you a brief history, a brief overview of some of the garden movements in British history. So the first one that we've got today is the medieval gardens. So this is up here. I've tried to pick a couple of kind of rough examples of what those kind of gardens would be like. So they tended to be quite enclosed spaces. Um, you were in a very turbulent period in history. So they wanted this to be a place of escape and respite from all the turmoil that was going on in the outside world. So they tended to have um, cloisters, if it was like at a monastery, or they would have tall walls as well, a really enclosed space. Um, they would often have herbs and different veg and fruit in the garden as well that could be used in the kitchen. Um, they would have arbors and secluded little spaces, um, that often the arbors would have something growing over them, um, climbing plants. And they also would have flowery mead as well, which was basically lawns with um, little flowers kind of growing through them, so daisies or straw, like little strawberries, that kind of thing. Um, and another feature, as I've tried to show down here, is a lot of them they would have moats or something kind of a, a body of water around the garden or the, the building as well, as another form of security to try and stop people from coming in and invading the space. Um, so that is kind of where we're starting. Obviously, there was more before that as well. There was evidence of, of um, gardens in the Roman period and like that kind of thing. But we're starting for a brief history today. We're starting here. Um, and obviously, a lot of the elements in those gardens we still want today. I mean, most of us want to feel a sense of privacy and seclusion when we're in our gardens. We don't want to feel overlooked. So that is something that we carry through today. The herbs and culinary side of things, a lot of us, we want to include that in our gardens. Um, we might not have a moat, maybe, in our gardens, but we might have a pond. Um, so a lot of these things that they did include in these spaces, we do have today. So uh, we start there, and then we're kind of moving next to more of a renaissance garden. So um, I've actually got a photograph that I took here um, from Pitmedden Garden, which is very local to us, just a bit further north. Um, and so these gardens, they were based off of either French, Italian, or sometimes even Dutch, kind of Renaissance um, gardens. They tended to be quite formal, and they would have a central axis um, in the garden, so things were quite symmetrical and balanced. Um, and they would often have, like we have here, um, a parterre. So it was these kind of hedges, low hedges, um, often could be box or that kind of thing, um, and they would be tightly clipped into different shapes. Um, they could even be kind of like knots and, and that kind of thing that they would have. And they sometimes would be planted with um, different little low-growing plants in amongst, or sometimes even different coloured kind of gravels and that kind of thing. Um, they would generally have a fountain or um, some sort of feature, water feature, in the, in the space as well. They would often have statues and that kind of thing in the, the garden. And it was all about this sense of grandeur. Generally, the people who had these gardens were very wealthy people, um, so it was a sense of status and a lot of them, they had maybe travelled to see these gardens in Italy and France. So it was kind of showing, you know, I've, I've been places, I've, I've travelled and I'm cultured, so um, they would want to bring this back to their own spaces. So I would say that Menden is, certainly in Scotland, that's a really good example of a Renaissance style garden. Um, they do have obviously newer additions in the garden as well, they've got lovely herbaceous borders too. But that is a really good example of the kind of thing that they, they had in these gardens. Um, a lot of them, they would be, especially the ones sort of based on the Italian and French Renaissance, they would be very formal, kind of relatively close to the house, maybe kind of looking down on these parterres. But certainly further away, they would often have these wildernesses or um, boscos, as it was known in Italy. And these were kind of where it was more just trees and it, made, it was made to look natural, even though it was all kind of man-made and planted up. Um, but these were kind of meant to show this contrast between the two. Um, so that is kind of our next period, which would be up to about maybe say the sort of mid 1600s thereabouts. And then we go on to the, well it's actually the English landscape movement, but there are a lot of places up in Scotland as well that you can see the influence of this um, period in gardening history. 
Um, so this is where it was kind of more about the, the overall landscape and it was kind of made to look natural, even though a lot of it was very, very man-made. Um, so you had a lot of these kind of follies and different grand sort of bridges and different buildings that they would have built, that, sometimes even ruins that were meant to look like they'd been there for years, but actually they were just built then. Um, you would also have quite often big lakes that were actually created just for this. Um, you would have a lot of trees that would have been planted, but you also kind of worked with the landscape beyond as well. So you kind of almost borrowed the landscape as well. So if you didn't have acres and acres, you could try and make it look like you did by kind of borrowing the landscape that was beyond your land um, and using that to best effect and kind of blending the two into one, if that makes sense. Um, you also had features like ha-has, which I always think that name is quite funny, um, but they were basically, it was to stop any of the livestock um, from coming up onto the land. So basically a ha-ha is where when you view it, it looks like it's just the land is kind of a one smooth kind of swoop right out, but actually you're up higher and then there'll be a steep drop and that's where you'll have your livestock down here so they can't come up onto the main bit of land. Um, so that was another key feature of that period. If you're interested in this sort of thing, you may have heard of Lancelot Capability Brown, um, who is a well-known figure in this movement. Um, so he didn't really start it, technically, it was more William Kent. He was kind of one of the key components um, to starting, or key um, figures again, in starting that movement. But certainly C Capability Brown is probably one of the most well-known people um, from that movement, um, and he designed many, many very well-known gardens which are still some of the most visited today. Um, so places like Stowe, um, which we have here, um, he designed or at least helped to design. Um, but there's this you can look it up and there's so many different places that he helped to design. But you can you can see um, common features in all of these gardens. Very swooping kind of landscapes, lots of lots of lawn, um, as I say trees as well are heavily featured but but used in a clever way so that it's still, you can see through the trees to, to different views and, and that kind of thing. Um, and then a lot of, like I said, a lot of kind of water tends to feature in that large lakes. So that takes us up um, into that period. And then next, really, we kind of go into the Victorian period. Um, for sake of this video, obviously there are um, lots of different subsections in history, however, just to make this a reasonably compact video next, we're kind of focusing on the Victorian period, which really, in the sense of um, British garden, garden history, is really quite an exciting period um, because there was a lot of advances in technology um, which helped us to be able to grow plants that previously we wouldn't have been able to have surviving in Britain. Um, but also there was a lot of exploration, a lot of bringing back different plants, um, again, the, we didn't know existed so you know there was a lot of study on plants um, and just yeah just a really quite exciting period in gardening history um, so when we think of the Victorian period this is kind of when we start to get more in the way of large glass houses like I have got here so this is a picture from Kew Gardens um, but obviously you know there, there's lots of different um, large glass houses that you can see not just in Britain but all over the world as well um, so the reason that these became more prevalent in society is because glass became a lot, lot cheaper, um, which previously it, it had been rather expensive, um, but also because of the materials that they could use to actually build these spaces, they could make much larger spaces now, um, and they were able to heat them as well um, through a different technology. So they were actually able to grow plants um, that they wouldn't have been able to previously. So this also links into the plant exploration because at this time there were lots of plant hunters going to all the different corners of the earth trying to find the newest, the latest thing that nobody had discovered before. Um, certainly not from Britain anyway. Um, so some of these plants obviously were hardy enough that they could withstand being outside. However, some of them came from much, much more mild climates than what we have here. In order to keep the plant um, healthy and happy, uh, they might have needed that glass house 
um, and the higher temperatures that it could provide to keep the plant doing well. Also, it meant that if they were bringing back seeds from different parts of the world, because they had these warmer spaces, it meant that the seeds were more likely to germinate as well, because instead of having to grow them in somewhere that was unheated, um, they could grow things much quicker with a much higher chance of germination um, in these spaces. So you found that, um, obviously Q is a very large example, but um, you find that wealthy landowners, um, wealthy people with large areas of land and large gardens, they start to be able to afford these um, glass houses. That is where you find that we start to get all these new plant um, species coming into the UK. And there were a lot of people in Scotland as well that were very keen plant collectors. Um, there were also plant hunters as well from Scotland too. They would have wanted the latest discoveries in their glass houses so that they could grow them. It was also, it was a sign of wealth as well to have something like that. Not everybody could afford that, but um, these wealthy landowners would have these um, so that they could grow all the new additions to their collections. Um, so we start there, but also in Victorian gardens they were very big on bedding or bedding out. Um, so you would tend to have I mean, two seasons um, where you would have, they would also plant, say, bulbs, that kind of thing. Um, in the autumn before the spring, and then they would, like we have here, so we've got kind of late spring, we've got the tulips there with the primroses underneath. Um, but then certainly in the summer, then they would take that out and they would have the um, summer bedding, things like Cavelia, Pogonias, all that kind of thing, um, they would have. But they would also interject it with some of the more kind of tropical species that they were starting to find, um, and add those in for a little bit of height, but it was very much so out of bedding. Um, they also they, they started to kind of build the rock gardens. So these rock gardens, let's put this picture here of this rock garden. This is actually one that I took from Brantham Gardens. This was cre created more in the 1920s. Um, but it's just to kind of give you an example of rock gardens. Um, so again, new additions to their plant collections that they maybe hadn't been able to grow before. Rock gardens were a real favourite with the Victorians. Um, and they really admired the little miniature forms of plants that you could grow in a rock garden. Um, so they became a firm favourite. And then things as well like ferneries. So the Victorians were really, really big on the ferns as well. And actually this is an example here of a fernery from Benmore. A lot of ferns aren't very hardy, but some of them are slightly more tender. So these ferneries, they would, um, like this one here is obviously enclosed. But some people would have the more hardy ones and just have a kind of like little ferny kind of down, you know. But ferns were a really big, big trend with the Victorians. They loved fern. So then moving on, as we kind of come towards the, the end of the Victorian era, um, we start to get a new movement. Um, so it was going away from this very kind of bedding focused and very kind of neat and tidy little kind of lines of um, the earlier Victorian period. And then you start to get these lovely herbaceous borders that are more kind of relaxed and soft. Um, still very colourful, just like the bedding, but just done in a slightly different way. Um, so as we go kind of towards the late 1800s and then into the 1900s, we come to this kind of style of gardening. Um, it was also in the early 1900s, the sort of the arts and crafts movement. As kind of part of that sort of movement, um, the garden designer Gertrude Jekyll, which you might have heard of, there is also a David Alston Rose named after her. Um, so she was a very prominent figure, and um, she was a garden designer. And she's designed so many different gardens up and down the UK. Um, so she, this was more her kind of style. There was still some formality, and there would be, you know, different um, kind of clipped hedges and that kind of thing, just to give a bit of structure. There was always some sort of evergreen structure there as well. But she would have these large herbaceous borders with swathes of plants, um, which just gave a more naturalistic kind of feel, as opposed to very prim, proper, and kind of formal um, gardens that we had seen earlier on in the period. That's why I thought I would end here, because really, I think you can see how her style of planting greatly influenced us even today, because now we see this more naturalistic style of planting. We know that it's it's better for the environment if we do this because there's more chance you're going to have plants that are good for wildlife. Um, there's also more habitat kind of in amongst all of that. Instead of just having everything 
formal and rigid and it's quite a sort of labour intensive way of doing things if you're constantly changing bedding and all you're doing is bedding. It's fine to have a little bit of bedding, you know, I mean everyone likes that, a nice cheery pop of colour, a few pots, a few hanging baskets. But as you can see here, I mean planting out all of those bedding plants, it takes a lot of time and a lot of labour and you have to make sure that you keep improving the soil and the weeding meticulously because it's so obvious when you see little weeds coming through bedding plants. Whereas this style of planting, where you just have a more natural feeling kind of border, um, it's all tightly packed almost, so weeds aren't going to get the same chance to get through and to germinate um, and take over the area. So it's much lower maintenance, although you still, you still need to improve the soil, you can't just plant it and leave it and that's it. Um, it is less labour intensive than doing big formal bedding schemes like this. So this is kind of where we are today, you know, especially with everything going on in the environment. Um, a lot of people are wanting a slightly more lower maintenance, you know, lives are busy, aren't they? We're all working and the 21st century is a very, <laughs> very busy time. Um, so I think people want gardens that look good, that are good for the environment, good for wildlife, um, but also they don't have to be tending 24-7. So this style of gardening is really kind of prominent today, I would say. Um, and it's only been enhanced by other garden designers and um, slightly different movements. But kind of, you can see the similarities. Things like the kind of prairie garden has pioneered that in uh, more recent times. But it's a similar sort of thing. It's, it's you know, borders with swathes of, of different perennial plants will come year on year. Um, and that's kind of what she was doing here. She would, she would use colours really effectively um, and different flower structures, she would use them really effectively. So um, I think that kind of ties us in to the current day and kind of where we are with our gardens now. Um, but yeah, I hope you have enjoyed my little brief history of British gardens. Um, I might say there's plenty that are here in Scotland, so there's plenty of gardens that you can visit that will kind of give you these examples. I hope you have enjoyed my brief history of British gardens.